If you would, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. I want to continue our series in Ephesians. Um, I title this message, From Conflict to Peace. You know, because of sin in the world, there's the people tend to put up barriers between people, you know, between races, between classes. You know, even in our history not so long ago, there was the, the thing of slavery. And although that was abolished a long time ago, we went through 100 years when a black person had to ride in the back of the bus or they couldn't eat in some restaurants. There was a separation going on. And, but we've come a long way. I mean, we even had a black president. So we've come a long way, but we've still got a ways to go. Um, I, I found it interesting this week. I saw a headline and I read the article um, that last week in South Africa, the parliament in South Africa voted that they can take farmland from white people. And um, the, the white people own 73% of the farmland in South Africa. And now they have passed a, a law that uh, they can just go in and take their farmland in South Africa. So um, I'm sure that's not going to turn out well. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. But we see divisions in our society. Um, Especially if you go to our cities, we see divisions between Hispanics, between um, blacks or whites or other ethnic groups, that all kinds of divisions and barriers between people. We see uh, divisions between rich people and poor people, between uh, you know politics, the left and the right. Um, you know, there's a big debate, gun lovers and gun haters, there's a big barrier there right now. And on and on it goes. What about at SRC? What about at our church? Do we have that problem here? Well, I hope not. I hope not. Um, I was thinking about, and you know, some of you come from a long background of going to church. Some of you have come here, and nobody's been here for a huge amount of time because the church just started 13 years ago. But some of you have come from other churches where you've had a background in church for a long time, and and you know your Bible, you know all the churchy terms that we use. And some of you are still kind of hanging on to some things from your old church. You know, I hear, I hear this comment sometimes. Well, in my old church, we did it this way, <laughs> you know. And sometimes we tend to kind of hang on to some of those things a little bit. But then there's some of you that never went to church before, before you came to SRC. And maybe you feel a little bit intimidated. You know, when I say turn to Ephesians uh, maybe you feel intimidated when the person beside you flips right to it and you're over here kind of hiding and finding the index to find Ephesians. And I want to tell you that's okay. That's fine. Because you're why this church is here. You're why we started this church 13 years ago. But that, that can be kind of, a, kind of a barrier maybe. I hope it's not. I hope it's not. But in our passage today, there was something similar going on in Ephesus. Uh, there was two groups of people. There was the Gentiles and there was the Jews. Now, the Jews, you know, they were the descendants of Abraham. They were God's chosen people. We talk about them a lot. And God had given them the law through Moses. God's design was to bless everyone through the Jewish people, everyone on earth. God told Abraham, said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. However, the Jews didn't exactly do that. They basically separated themselves, and on top of all the laws that God had given them, they came up with, um, some say, 600 more laws that even separated them further from uh, the Gentiles, from the other people. And these, but these were the people who thought they knew it all, right? Um, when it came to the things of God, they thought they had the inside track. They thought they had all the answers. They were the old school religious people of the day. And then there was another group, the Gentiles. Uh, that was everybody else who's not a Jew. You're probably a Gentile here this morning. Um, you know, their evidence of God was manifested in creation. Romans 1 says, for since the creation of the qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. So the Bible says, you know, even those who didn't have the law, that didn't have uh, all the teachings of Moses and so forth, 
they were really without excuse as well because you could actually see the workings of God in creation. Okay, And you should have some understanding of God, some understanding of right and wrong in creation. But mostly they fell into paganism. It wasn't that they weren't religious. They were very religious. But they were worshiping other gods. They had the sun, the moon, the stars that they worshiped. They had hundreds of gods. They had, they had religion. And in Ephesus, they had the great temple to the goddess Artemis that we talked about a little last week. <clears throat> so now there is this dilemma in Ephesus. There were Jews and Gentiles who were coming to faith in Jesus Christ and they were coming to the same church. And how are they supposed to melt together? How are they supposed to respond to that? How should the Jews respond to that? How should the Gentiles respond to that? How can these two very different and often very antagonistic groups of people come together and worship together in the same church? So Paul addresses the situation. In Ephesians chapter 2, let's start reading in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Okay, so he starts out here talking about the Gentile situation, the reality of where they were. The first thing, if you've got your notes, is they were separated socially. They were separated socially. He talks about circumcision. It was a a physical distinction that all Jews and all Gentiles understood. It was the Jews were required by law to be circumcised. It had gotten to the point where the Jews thought of themselves as better because they were circumcised. They had utter disdain for anyone who was uncircumcised. We can, we can hear it in David's voice. When he comes and he faces the giant Goliath, and he makes this statement, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What he was basically saying was, who is this non-Jew who is defying the armies of the living God? It would have been sufficient to say, well, who is this Philistine? The Philistines were the enemies of the Jewish people. But he had to get that little dig in there, didn't he? And that was very common of the Jewish people. That disdain was kind of bred into them. You know, unfortunately, racism is still alive and well in America today and around the world. Blacks hating blacks, whites hating blacks. Blacks hating whites, whites hating blacks, and so forth. I don't know if you were in here when we played the video at the beginning. Mandisa's song, We All Bleed the Same. We all, I love that song because there's a real message in that song. We're all the same on the inside. We all bleed the same. If we can just come together, come together, 
um, it, it says we're more beautiful when we come together. We all bleed the same, so tell me why. Tell me why we're divided. It says, are you left, are you right, pointing fingers, taking sides? Are you black, are you white? Aren't we all the same inside? We're all the same inside. See, Paul made it very clear that the condition of the heart was much more important than the outside. In Romans, he says, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. God called the Jewish people out and gave, him, gave them his laws for two reasons. Two reasons that God came to Moses and gave Moses their laws. One, he wanted the world to see and notice them. He wanted the world to see how they should act as holy people of God, not like other men. Second thing, he wanted them to be so different that they could never just blend in with other nations, but that they would draw other nations to them. But what happened was they separated themselves even more. They became proud. They looked down their noses at other people. When they came home from, an, <clears throat> from another country, they would shake the dust off their, off their feet because they didn't want to bring any Gentile dirt into their land. All these crazy things that they came up with. The Samaritans were half-breeds, part Jew, part Gentile, and they totally separated themselves from them. Wouldn't even walk through their, through their territory. Completely rejected them. You know, Jonah displayed the attitude that they had when God came to Jonah and said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach to those people. Well, those pre people were Gentiles. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. We know the story how he got in a boat and he ran away from God. But God turned him around miraculously when he had a fish swallow him and, and brought him back and he eventually did go to Nineveh. Because of his preaching in Nineveh, the people of Nineveh repented. And because they repented, Jonah goes up on a hill and he's, he's so depressed he wants to die. <laughs> he didn't want them to repent, even though he preached it. He didn't want them to repent. He wanted revenge, not repentance. He thought the Jews or the Gentiles should be judged, not forgiven. So throughout history, there's always been this conflict between Jews and Gentiles. It's still going on today. Um, we know in the last century when Hitler killed six million Jews. And today we see Israel surrounded again with its enemies, with people making threats against the Jewish people even today. So that barrier is still there, still there. So there's a separation between Jews and Gentiles physically. And also the second thing is spiritually. If we look at verse 12, he says, Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship. The first thing he says, you're without Christ, without Christ. See, much more important than being separated socially is, is spiritually. They didn't, they didn't have um, all, the, all the prophecies about Christ coming, about the Messiah coming. They didn't know about all of those things. There's five different things that he says separated them spiritually. The first one is without Christ. They had all their pagan gods, of course. Um, you know, pagan idolatry always thrives. It always thrives on fear and despair rather than trust and hope. They had their goddess that they worshipped, but it's always in fear. You think of the other religions of the world, it's always in fear. you got to... It, it got to the point where they would, they would sacrifice their children to this goddess out of fear and, and all these things because um, they felt like there was something, something inside, something that they wanted to worship to bring favor on themselves. But it wasn't the true God. It wasn't the true God. The second thing is without citizenship. You know, God set Israel up as a theocracy as himself, as the, as the ultimate leader, the ultimate authority over Israel. 
He gave the nation this special blessing, protection, and love. To be Gentile was to be without citizenship in that theocracy. You know, there's always this huge debate about immigrants coming to our country. And uh, legally or illegally. You know, and, and, I, and I feel for those who are among us illegally, without citizenship. And we can have the debate whether they should come or whether they shouldn't. And I, and I guarantee you, if I was in their shoes and I was facing the things they're facing, I'd probably do exactly the same thing they did. I'd probably swim across that river too. Uh, but that doesn't make it right. It's against the law, but I'm just saying. So here they are in America, but they don't have the protection that American citizens have. Okay? There are certain things that American citizens have a right to that someone who is not a citizen does not have a right to. And that's basically what Paul is saying. You know, having citizenship in Israel as a Jew gave you certain rights. It gave you certain protections from God himself. And the Gentiles were without that citizenship in Israel. The next thing he says is, we're without God's covenants. He says, foreigners to the covenants. Now, what's he referring to there? Well, if we go all the way back to Abraham and we go back to the covenant that God made with Abraham, and let's let's think about this a little bit, how God made that covenant with Abraham and to Abraham's descendants. Anybody that was a descendant of Abraham got those covenants, and when God makes a covenant, he keeps it. And it was this, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was a covenant that God made with Abraham. And so the people of Israel came under that covering, that covenant that God had made with them. The the next thing he says is without hope. Without hope. You know, those who are without Christ, without citizenship and without the promises of God's covenants are really without hope without hope you know Job had a very sorry lament at one time when he was at a very low point in his life he says my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and they come to an end without hope without hope You know, people who are without hope think that when you die, that's just all there is. You cease to exist, or your spirit wanders aimlessly throughout the universe, or you'll be reincarnated as a bug or a cow or something else. That's hopelessness. But how different was David's perspective when he said in Psalm 146, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. The Gentiles didn't have that hope like David did. Psalm 71, he says, For you have been my hope, O sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. Hope. Hope. Do you have that hope this morning? Do you have that hope? You know, the Jews understood that they were putting their hope in the God of the universe. The Gentiles didn't have that hope. They had their hope in these pagan gods where the Jews had their hope in the God of the universe. They'd had those teachings all their lives. All their lives. And then he says, finally he says, without God. You Gentiles were without God. And again, it doesn't mean that they were atheists. It doesn't mean that they weren't religious. Some of them were very religious. In fact, when Paul went to Athens, they had all these monuments set up to all these different gods. And then he comes to one and it said, to the unknown God. Because they were afraid they missed one. And so Paul says to him, he says, hey, I'm here to tell you about this unknown God. The one that you don't know. And then he started telling them about Jesus Christ. So it wasn't that they weren't religious. They just didn't know the true God the God that we worship. 
Galatians 4, 8 says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Okay? Again, they were worshiping pagan gods. Now, it wasn't that God rejected the Gentiles. It was that they had rejected God. They might not have had the law, but they had access to to God if they wanted to. Romans tells us that. It says, even when Gentiles who do not have God's written law instinctively follow what the law says, they show that in their hearts they know right from wrong. They demonstrate that God's law is written within them for their own conscience, either accuse them or tell them they are doing what is right. So God called the Jews out for a separate purpose, separate people, not to alienate the Gentiles, but to draw the Gentiles in, draw the Gentiles in. Okay, so what about the church today? Too many times the church, I believe, has been guilty of the same thing that the Jews were doing. God has called the church to reach out to those around us, to evangelize the world, to spread the gospel everywhere. And too many times I see Christians walking around with their kind of their nose in the air and they're like, I'm good and I don't care about anybody else. I've seen churches where they say, well, we're, we're interested in quality, not quantity. You know, we've got kind of got our holy huddle here and we don't want to bring somebody in that will kind of rock the boat. I told some church leaders one time that had that attitude, <laughs> what you're really saying is that the rest of the community can just go to hell. Right? That's what you're really saying. We've got this barrier put up. And that's the kind of the way it was with some of the Jews and the Gentiles in Ephesus. But let's continue, because there's a very important little word in verse 13. But, but now, but now. Thank God again for the, the buts in the Bible. But now, in Christ Jesus... You who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You know, the Jews had always considered themselves to be near to God and the Gentiles far off. But he says, now, now through Jesus Christ, everyone has access to the same promises, the same covenants, the same hope. Everyone has access to the same thing through Jesus Christ. So how does he do, how does he do that? Let's Let's go on and see what he has to say in verse 14. He says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. It's through Jesus Christ that we have peace with God and others. We have peace with God and others. You know, just as sin is the root of all conflict, It is also the enemy of all peace. It's the enemy of all peace and harmony. But it's only through Jesus Christ that these things can be reconciled. We look at all the problems we have in the world. We look at all the divisions we have in the world. And let me tell you, they can try all kinds of laws. They can try all kinds of different things to try to correct all these things. But I'm here to tell you, there's only one thing that's going to fix it, and that's Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's going to fix it, is when people come to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was saying to the Ephesians. He said, it's only through Jesus Christ that you can come together. That you can come together. See, sin, sin is really selfishness. It's thinking about what I want and what's good for me. James 4 says it this this way. He says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Isn't it the whole army of evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have as you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous for what others have and you can't possess it. So you quarrel to take it away from them. And yet, the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole motive is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. James is saying, 
You're asking for the wrong thing. You want the wrong thing. You only want what's good for you instead of what's good, what's right, what's good for the, for the body of Christ. See, conflict comes when we demand our rights. I'm going to fight what's mine. Fight for what's mine. Peace comes when self dies. How many times the Bible says we have to die to self? We have to die to ourselves. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, but now, we are brought near. We have peace with God and others. The third thing is, we are all the same. We are all the same. It says he destroyed the barrier, the wall of hostility. You know, in the temple, there was a wall. There was a wall that was put up that divided the temple into different, should, could say rooms or different courts. And the outer court, there was a, it was what they called the Gentile court. And there was a sign that read, No Gentile may enter within the barricade which surrounds the sanctuary and enclosure. Anyone who is caught doing so will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. God had intended the outer court to be a place to evangelize the Gentiles, but the Jews had turned it into a place to do commerce. And we know what Jesus did when he came in there and he turned over the, the uh, tables of the money changers. Years ago, I had heard somebody make the comment about our entrance out here called it a narthex. I was like, I wasn't very familiar with that term, so I looked up what, where's that come from? What, why do you call that a narthex? And so I looked back into history a little bit to see where that came from. And where it came from was, was back years and hundreds of years ago. Some of the Catholic churches had, had an area um, set apart, um, kind of in the entrance area off to the side, where people could come who, who weren't really right with God and weren't allowed into the sanctuary until they were right with God. Please don't call that a narthex. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't like that word. That's the entrance. That's a foyer, whatever you want to call it. Just don't call it a narthex, okay? Everybody's welcome in here, all right? We're not going to keep anybody out. Um, they're welcome. In World War II, a group of American soldiers lost their buddy in battle. They carried their body to the only cemetery that they could find, and it was at, happened to be a Catholic cemetery. And the priest, when the priest discovered that this young soldier was, was not a, a uh, Catholic, he wouldn't allow them to bury him in the cemetery. And so not knowing what else to do, they buried him uh, right outside the fence of the cemetery. The next morning, they went back to um, pay their last respects to their buddy again, and, and they couldn't find a grave outside the cemetery. So they asked the, the priest, and the priest told him of a quandary he had. He said, the first part of the night, I lay awake feeling sorry for what I did. The rest of the night, I spent moving the fence, allowing him in. Jesus moved the fence. He moved the fence. He allowed the Gentiles in. Galatians 3.28 says, There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. For you are all Christians. You are one in Christ Jesus. The fourth thing this morning is we are reconciled. We are reconciled. In verse 16 says, And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. Through the cross. Jesus. God. The Holy Spirit. The Trinity. We are reconciled. Brought together through the cross. Colossians 1, 19, 20 says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, 
whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Reconciliation, bringing back together what once was, what once was supposed to be. We were separated by sin, and it's only through the cross that we can bring, be reconciled back to God. And Paul's saying it's the same for Jew or Gentile, for black or white, for whoever. It's the same. It's the same. Number five, we have access to God. We have access to through Him, Christ. We both Jews and Gentiles have access to the Father by one Spirit. The Greek word for this access is only used three times in the Bible. That word in ancient times was just used to describe going in to see a king, getting access to a king. You know, if you want to go to to the White House and you want to go see President Trump, you're not going to walk into the Oval Office. It's just not going to happen, okay? You have to have access. You have to have a reason to be there. You have to have somebody, some connections to get you into that place. It's the same way with God. You, you don't just meet up with God. God says, nobody can ever see my face and live. You have to have a way to get in, and that is through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we have access to God. And again, it's the same for Jews and Gentiles. And then number six, we have unity of believers. We have unity of believers. So for the Ephesians, this diverse group of people, how could they come together and have unity? It was through Jesus Christ. You know, a group of you spent some time in Nicaragua last week and with some people who are from a very different culture than we are. Uh, they have different ways to worship than we do. They have different ways to express themselves than we do. They, they live differently than we do. And yet, the one thing that unifies us, that brings us together, is our faith in Jesus Christ. Our faith in Jesus Christ. You know, as we look across our world today, and we see the problems in our world, they're the same problems they had back then. We see all these divisions by race, by tribes, by religions, by class. Uh, we see constant bickering and fighting, maybe, maybe even in families, uh, maybe even in marriages, all the, the bickering and fighting that can happen. And I'm here to tell you this, there's just one way, one way to resolve those, and that's through Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ this morning. Because He is... The Prince of Peace, Isaiah calls him. The Prince of Peace. He's the common denominator. If we look at verse 14, it tells us that he is the Prince. He's taken away that hostility. He's taken away that barrier. He says, for he himself is our peace. There is no other peace that I know of. We can try all kinds of other things. We can, try, we can try counseling. We can try all kinds of other things to bring peace. But let me tell you, it's only through the Prince of Peace that we'll have that true peace. Let's stand as we pray this morning. Father, I just want to come to you this morning. I thank you this morning for your word and Father, I thank you that you are the Prince of Peace, that we can count on you. And Father, there, there's, there's somebody here this morning, I can feel it in my spirit, that has, has got conflict going on in their life. Um, they've got conflict going on in their life with someone, and they've tried different things to resolve that conflict, but, but it's only through Jesus Christ that they can do that today. You're the one that brings, brings peace. You, you can bring peace between races. You can bring peace between nations. You can bring peace between fellow church members. 
You can bring peace between families and husbands and wives. And I just pray, God, for that peace today, that you would take down those barriers, take down those walls that we have put up, tear them down, and bring peace. Thank you, God.